So we're going to talk about empires, states, and the new world from 1500 to 1775. Many changes began in the period from 1500 to 1775. First, the world became irreversibly interconnected. Columbus' voyage to the Americas and the Spanish establishment of a trans-Pacific voyage to the Philippines and then back to Europe around Africa brought the world together in a single trading network. Second, Eurasian empires continued to be the most successful way of organizing human society in history and continued to grow economically, politically, and in terms of populations during this period. This also leads us to the question of why we are not now living in empires, but have reorganized our societies into nation states. This has to do with the fact that no European state ever successfully created a continental empire. Competition between European states combined with ge geography, religious change, and new military technology from 1500 to 1775 led Europe to remain divided. As European states became more powerful, the nation-state model was exported to other parts of the world very slowly. This has to do with the third process of change in this period, European sovereign states and the use of war. Finally, all of these processes occurred during a, a natural global crisis known as the Little Ice Age, when climate change interacted with globalization and global war. Across Eurasia, there were five great empires that were in the process of dramatic expansion after 1500. China, Russia, the Mughal, Mughal India, uh, Safavid Iran, and the Ottoman Empire. China and Russia expanded most dramatically during this period. Russia expanded all the way from the Baltic Sea to the Pacific Ocean, taking control of vast parts of Eurasia, north of Europe, into Central Asia, and all the way into Siberia, as well as southward into Ukraine, Crimea, and even Poland. China, already the world's largest and most powerful empire, at first lost territory and power due to loss of economic vitality during the Little Ice Age. This opened the way for conquest by the Manchus, who adopted Chinese language, ideas, and culture, and ruled as an elite on top of Chinese society. The Qing Empire, which belonged to the Manchus, beginning in 1644, expanded to control Tibet, much of Central Asia, and Mongolia. The power and economic importance of the Qing Empire also meant that it had strong influence over many East Asian and Southeast Asian cultures, including those of Vietnam, Korea, and Japan. Its tribute trade system also gained for it acceptance of Chinese superiority in Southeast Asia and much of the Indian Ocean. All three of these empires were ruled by peoples of nomadic Turkish origin. All had adopted Islam as their religion, primarily for its usefulness as an organizational strategy and in creating legitimacy for these foreign rulers of Indian and Middle Eastern states. All three were multi-ethnic, and all three shared to some degree a need to be tolerant of non-Muslim religions and non-Turkic cultures. In all three, though, with different interpretations, Islam formed the foundation of law and provided the legitimacy of government power. But Islam also provided the foundation of ideas of religious tolerance and equity and of government attempts to reduce corruption and rule with a fair hand. As these empires expanded, they also came to control large parts of the Eurasian trade system. The trade routes across the Indian Ocean, for example, were as much under Mughal control as they were under European control. The routes across the continent from Asia to Europe were controlled by the Ottoman and Safavid empires. In addition to the large size of these empires meant that they were geographically and so economically diverse. They produced farm goods, including saffron, wheat, coffee, cotton, and sugar, and controlled the markets in spices. They had large mining concerns and controlled many of the world's greatest ports. They also had large and powerful armies, which helped them to expand. So what's an empire? An empire is an extensive group of states ruled over by a single ruling elite, usually a single person, an emperor or empress, or a family, though not limited to those small groups. 
In an empire, diverse groups of people pay homage to the ruling elite through the surrender of a portion of their economic output, which they render to the rulers as taxes. Empires are not defined by language or even by geographical contiguity, but by the elite which controls them. The fact that empires have always been among the most efficient and effective means of organizing human societies. Their large size provides for large economies whose resources can be brought to bear in diverse and effective ways. The diversity of geography, culture, and economic means also allows empires to weather difficulties that systems with fewer resources and less diversity have difficulty with. In the period between 1500 and 1775, almost all of Eurasia was ruled by empires. Wars between these empires were minimal. Economic development was generally high. Such also was the case in the Americas before their discovery by Europeans, a topic which is discussed in the next presentation. The exception to this was Europe. Almost as soon as they reached Asia at the end of the 15th century, Europeans, particularly the Portuguese, who were the first to get there, discovered that they were poor. Trading in the Indian Ocean trade was expensive and the Portuguese, Dutch, and English had to buy low quality spices or resort to extortion using their armed ships. Indian Ocean traders were not armed to extort or steal trade goods in order to make a profit. Spanish discovery of silver in the New World changed all that. The vast quantities of silver that the Spanish gained access to in their conquest of South America made them wealthy in global terms. However, the Spanish had no direct access to Asia, at least initially. Instead, they spent their silver buying weapons and goods from the Dutch, English, and Portuguese. Eventually, the Spanish gained control of the Philippines and sent their silver galleons across the Philippines, where they put the silver on ships bound for China. In China, they bought silk and then sold it for more silver in Japan, then took the profit and principal and brought it back to Spain to pay their mounting bills as they tried to conquer a European empire. Eventually, nearly two-thirds of all New World silver wound up in China, where unminted silver was the primary currency. This huge influx of silver sent both the Spanish and Chinese economies into recession and made the Dutch and English wealthy. Their success allowed them to push Portugal out of most of Asian trade and even take over Portuguese trading posts in Southeast Asia. One of the key changes that brought the New World economy into connection with that of the rest of the world was not just the silver, which eventually ran out. Instead, the Portuguese, then the Spanish, and eventually the English as well, began to create an agricultural economy in the New World, which they used to export new products and transplanted older products. They created large plantations worked initially by Native American slaves, then by African slaves after the great dying that destroyed the Native American labor pool. These plantations provided older products like sugar and new products like tobacco at very low cost to the rest of the world, thanks to the transatlantic triangular trade. Much of the profits from these plantation ventures became a part of what historians refer to as a great wealth transfer. Unpaid slave labor and appropriation of American land from Native Americans essentially allowed European plantation owners to grow and export these goods with little or no overhead costs, thus leading to great profits. For most plantation owners, the goal was to become great landowners in Europe and improve their social status. Thus, they exported most of their profits to Europe as well, as investments in European plantations or businesses or government. This effectively transferred the value of Native American and African labor and the value of land to the plantation owners as assets rather than costs. The chaos of the 17th century in Europe is well known. European states in the 17th century endured rebellions, religious and political wars, revolutions, social crises, population declines, and economic depression. This is known as the general crisis of the 17th century. What has recently become understood is the role which the Little Ice Age played in that series of crises. The general cooling of the climate globally reduced agricultural harvests and thus caused economies worldwide, all of which were dependent upon agriculture, to go into sharp declines as governments and people searched for new resources, conflict both between empires and within the empires also rose. China saw large declines in harvests, the economy and population. So did Europe. Up to one third to one half of people died during this period. Because most people farmed, the largest impact was in rural areas. 
Some of the empires, notably the Mughals in India, recognized that climate was having an impact on production and saved their people by providing for tax relief during the difficult times. In most cases, however, adjustments were not made and tremendous loss of life and wealth followed. This led to warfare, which, particularly in Europe, where numerous small states all had roughly the same resources and power, warfare became the defining factor of the period. The crisis of the 17th century led European rulers to look for ways to accrue new resources to replace those that were being lost. They were willing to use force if necessary, both on other European states and upon their own people. However, it was less costly and troublesome to find ways to convince their subjects to voluntarily render those resources to them. To this end, they began developing political and philosophical systems for that purpose. The idea of divine right kingship came from this situation. Monarchs, with the help of the Catholic Church and sometimes Protestant churches, made claims to having been chosen by God. This would mean that subjects owed their kings anything they asked for, since the kings were earthly representatives of God. See the presentation on European political systems for more on this. More, European monarchs began to claim rights to the loyalty of their subjects based on other ideas as well. By the late 18th century, they were claiming that monarchs provided a protection for the social contract. By enforcing law and maintaining order, monarchs made it possible for people to carry out the business of their daily lives. This social contract idea meant that monarchs should have the right to tax people and require their labor and armed participation in the military to carry out this duty. Eventually, monarchs and their surrogates also began to claim that people within their kingdoms shared certain things. Culture history, perhaps even language, that made them different from subjects of other monarchs, and thus in defending the monarch's land they were also defending their own culture. Thus European kings began building centralized states with legal, philosophical, and practical reasons to exist, even as they continued to fight with each other and try to establish empires. The fact that while the number of states declined to a few powerful ones, none ever successfully established a Europe-wide empire ensured the continuation of competition and the further development of the European state system. Of course, another key to European power in the 17th century was state finance. The economic system that we call mercantilism was developed to provide the state the wealth it needed to fight endless wars against other European states. Mercantilism was not an economic theory as say capitalism or socialism are today. Instead, it was a set of practical procedures designed by monarchs in European states to help them accrue the maximum amount of bullion, that is actual precious metals, possible in order to have more money than their enemies. Theories of war at the time held that when two states went to war, the state with more money would win. So France, England, German principalities, and Spain developed practical methods to achieve this goal. Their first priority was to control their economies. Mercantilism included policies that discouraged people in one state from trading with people in another state. The only international trade that was acceptable was that in which one gained more in the exchange and could thus pay high taxes to the state. Trade with colonies was encouraged because the colonizing state could charge taxes on nearly every stage of the transportation and manufacturing processes. This led to what European states called navigation acts, which set up tariffs for trade between a mother country and its colonies. States also rewarded monopolies to businesses, as the English and Dutch did with their respective East India companies, in order to allow those companies to make high profits, which could then be taxed heavily to provide the state with income. The Seven Years' War is a case in point, a historical event where we can see all of these changes coming into play. In 1756, France and Russia attacked Prussia and the German principalities. The goal was to increase French and Russian territory and to reduce the power of Prussia, one of the states that would eventually become Germany. Together, France and Russia had many more soldiers and much more money than the Prussians. So the Prussians allied with Great Britain, which sent few soldiers but used its navigation acts and large empire to finance Prussia in its fight. Eventually recognizing the power of the British Empire, the French attempted to cut off Britain's access to the wealth of its Indian and American possessions by fighting on the sea in India and supplying Native Americans to fight the British colonies in the Americas. The British-Prussian alliance won the war, however, because of its greater financial power. In this story, we have the centralized power of four great nation-states, the ambition to build Europe-wide empires to rival those of the Ottomans and the Chinese, and the mobilization of technology and armies 
along with the economic importance of colonies and the mercantilist system. In many ways, we can see the events of 1500 to 1775 as a kind of connection between all of these different activities and other events that lead to the result of states in Europe.